through this Envision Lecture Series, we've had basically four, four goals. One is to obviously educate on these topics to the community at large, to inspire and engage community stakeholders, to build advocacy for home and community-based services, that, uh, like the things that SACOA provides to keep uh, people in their home and in optimal health for as long as possible, and also to stimulate collaborative partnerships. So we look at this lecture series as not just education, but calls to action. So learn something today and then go out and change the world, essentially. And so uh, with today's topic on research, we've got two wonderful people, two friends. Um, and with, with this condition, you know, what we're seeing dementia, it's, it's rampant in our communities in Indiana, across the nation, across the world. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, an epidemic pr uh, proportion. And that's only, unfortunately only going to get uh, greater and greater. So our goal for today is to gather more information and, and develop a better understanding about dementia and the impact it has in our communities and the research both today and going forward. As well as look at the fact that uh, dementia is not just a macro level component. Um, obviously dementia affects our families, our local communities. And so in addition to uh, Dr. Jerry Brosh, Brosh, he responds to both. Um, <laughs> We're going to hear from a friend of mine, Tom Coverdale, who has a very unique experience that he's going to share with you about uh, you know, what it's like to, to be a caregiver for somebody with dementia in, in the real world situation. So what I, what I like about today is that we're going to have a look at what the future holds as far as research and where we're going, but also have a real world snapshot about what we need to do today in our communities because uh, this is affecting our communities today and, and right now. So what do we do about it now? while we also plan and look for the future. So, um, so I'll, we'll get started with our first speaker, Dr. Jared Brosh. Um, he's a Fort Wayne native who completed his bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering at Purdue University and he received his medical doctorate from Indiana University. Currently, Dr. Brosh is a neurologist at Indiana University where he specializes in the treatment of dementia. He is part of the university's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and he runs multiple clinical trials for drugs that treat neurological, neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other types of dementia. Um, what I also like about Dr. Brosh is not only is he a renowned research expert, but he does see patients in the real world, and so he can provide both those perspectives to you. So um, it's good to get the band back together, Dr. Brosh. Welcome to Sokoa, and um, I'll let you take it from here. So please welcome Dr. Jerry Brosh. Thanks, Justin. Um, I have a microphone on. Can everybody hear me okay? I want to make sure it works. Awesome. Uh, so I, I have a really fun presentation for us today. I'll try and prevent you guys from getting to sleep without too much coffee in you today. Um, I have to acknowledge that uh, Indiana University receives support from lots of different pharmaceutical companies so that I can spend time not only seeing patients, but also trying to work on new drugs and new treatments for all kinds of dementia. Um, so I've got three things I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, the first of which was the hottest topic at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, which is lifestyle. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about treatments for Alzheimer's disease, of which there's been some real excitement this week, and I can definitely talk more about that and give you more detail than you've read in the news stories. And then we'll talk a little bit about other types of neurodegenerative conditions that we're trying to help more and more. So this just represents um, a little picture, and I, I try to give credit for all the pictures that I've stolen uh, from Google Images here. Uh, all, you'll see links for all of those things, but uh, it just is an, a reminder that at any point, at any age, we can change our old habits and find newer, better habits that might help prevent dementia, slow down dementia, and provide a better lifestyle for all of us. Um, and the five core things that have been published recently are, uh, you know, kind of captured in a pictorial view here. And I'll go through each one of these things. And there are three giant studies that have been recently completed that really add a lot of credence to these recommendations that we make to people every day and all those things that you hear your doctor say and maybe ignore sometimes. So the, the first of these things is uh, fitness exercise and people are probably tired of hearing about it but it is really critically important um, and the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association are currently recommending two and a half hours 
of aerobic fitness activity per week. Uh, and the best way to do this is in 20 to 30 minute blocks of time, as opposed to people in my clinics who say, well, I went up and down the stairs four or five times today, that's got to count for something. Well, maybe it does a little bit because you were moving, but uh, in addition to moving, we want people to move for blocks of time where they're exercising their heart and improving the stability of their blood vessels. Because if you can imagine, you've got these brain cells that are being damaged and ravaged by amyloid plaques and tau tangles and Alzheimer's disease. And those damaged cells are looking for any sort of power, nutrient, and health, healthy thing that it can get through the blood. So the, the better we can supply it with all those things that it needs to stay alive, it's going to stay alive longer and we're going to slow down our disease. So it just makes sense from a, if you were a, a brain cell standpoint. Um, besides that, you know, any type of exercise that gets your heart rate elevated a little bit really counts. I add pickleball to this because this is a really popular thing. I've, I've started playing myself with my father-in-law who recently <laughs> retired. Um, and then there's a few reports out there that state that you know, far less than 50% of people over the age of 60 are hitting this goal. So you can start any time at trying to achieve this. I just tell people don't go out and try and do two and a half hours this week if you haven't been doing anything because you'll tear something up and then you'll be in the bed for a couple of weeks. So go at it slow, but, tr but think about this as being an important goal. Um, other things that have come up, the Mediterranean style diet, um, also linked to this is the MIND diet, which has to do with low sodium and Mediterranean, but the concept behind this diet is pretty simple. It's a vegetable based diet, so we want to have more vegetables than anything else. We should avoid certain foods like red meat, cheese, butter, dairy products, um, uh, pastry items. Think about those things as an occasional dessert item as opposed to a core part of our diet. That's really what Mediterranean style diet boils down to. Make healthier protein choices when you do choose to eat animal proteins like fish or chicken. Uh, incorporate legumes, mix nuts, things like that. Those are, those are really the core um, tenets of the Mediterranean style diet. This has also been shown independently in studies to help slow progression of cognitive decline and also in these cumulative studies I'll talk about in a minute. Cognitive exercise, so in addition to exercising our body, our vascular system, the heart and all of that, we, we also want to exercise our brain. It's another muscle in a sense. Um, we got to keep it active and you've probably heard about this before. We don't know what the best type of exercise is for the brain per se. Um, we know that certain things have shown benefit in most of these studies that I'll, you'll see in a minute. They focused on computer-based training systems. Um, again, there's none that's, that's currently recommended. But just getting out and doing things like social activity has been linked with uh, slower decline uh, in both uh, primate studies and in humans. So it does make a big difference just being socially active. But Doing something is better than nothing instead of sitting in front of a TV screen, which is, is not doing any exercise, thinking about integrating something into our life beyond that. This is a no-brainer, um, no smoking. Uh, you know, this is probably uh, showing benefit because of the toll it takes on those blood vessels. So we know that smoking is very bad for blood vessels, and so we're sacrificing that supply of nutrients to those damaged cells by smoking. And then a very controversial topic, which is alcohol consumption. Um, most of the studies that uh, I'll report on here in just a second looked at no more than one drink a day. Um, you know, the American Heart Association has had made statements that have said, well, one drink a day might be okay. It might actually help cardiovascular disease. Um, but no amount of alcohol has ever been proven to be beneficial to brain health. So it's a controversial topic. I don't encourage people to start consuming alcohol if they don't already. But if you do consume it, try and cap it at one drink. Um, and when, it, when we say one drink, of course, we're not talking about one, <laughs> one drink. One, one drink, uh, you know, the generally accepted one drink is 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. Um, so, so think about that, and then try not to catch up. If you said, oh, I was good all week, I'm going <laughs> to, this weekend, you know, I'm do a six pack. Uh, also not healthy, but anyway, uh, ju just think about that. It, it's, it's a fluid topic. We don't know what the end is going to be, but right now it's looking like one drink a day is okay. So the, the studies that I'm referring to, 
Um, I've just put the names of them up here. I haven't given tons of information about them, but the one that came out first, which is was was really kind of earth shaking, was this finger study, a Finnish study where they it was actually a randomized control study, which is really really hard to do when we're talking about lifestyle. So they had intervention groups and non-intervention groups and they had computer-based studies, they gave people personal trainers, they supplied them with diet classes, they didn't give them actual food, but um, you know this went on for two years and they showed a 25 percent improvement in the people's test scores who were in the intervention group, the people who were getting and doing most of those lifestyle changes as we've talked about. Um, and in this data which they've extrapolated they said, wow, this if, if everybody did this then the incidence of Alzheimer's disease would go down quite a bit. Um, and they're, they're, they have ongoing studies looking at this longer term, and they're looking at further interventions. But this was really the first study that, um, that really brought this to light. Um, published this year was a large study out of the UK. This is observational. They looked at 200,000 people, which is pretty amazing, all over 60 years of age. And they, they showed a 32% reduction in the risk of dementia over an eight-year period in individuals who um, did those lifestyle factors. And they, this was through surveys, so it's harder to tell, but they, that's a big number for 200,000 people. And they said, there's really a lot here. We need to do a lot more studying on this, but that, that's a big number. And then uh, out of Russia and Chicago, they also have a couple of cohorts looking at approximately 2,000 people. Um, and they, they found that a, there was a 60% reduction in the rate of developing Alzheimer's disease um, over a six to nine year period. And this was regardless of their genetic risk. So if you've got mom or dad or grandmother who have Alzheimer's disease, or you know you're an APOE4 carrier or homozygote or heterozygote, it didn't matter. The lifestyle changes still made a big impact. So when people come to me and they say, I know I've got APOE and my mom's got it and my mom's mom's got it, you know, I'm doomed. Not true. Not true. Do these things and we know it makes an impact and that was just proven through, uh, through Chicago. So that, that's big news for all of Alzheimer's disease, I think. So I'm going to just transition a little bit into a discussion about the drugs that are out there. Um, this is just a, a brief, brief comment about the FDA approved drugs. I know a lot of people um, have different thoughts about these drugs. At some points, um, even, even other physicians have called me up and said, hey, are these things snake oil? Do they really work? What are we talking about here? And as you know, we have four approved drugs, really. I mean, there's combo drugs and so on and so forth and extended releases that I haven't listed here. But uh, these four drugs, they really do work. Um, and the earlier we use them, the more impact they have. And although they're only approved in uh, mild, moderate, and severe stage disease, not in mild cognitive impairment or pre-dementia states, um, we, we think they might have an effect, at least in mild cognitive impairment. There's data growing about maybe if we start these even earlier, they might buy us more time. And, you know, these really are not memory enhancers, and that's where a lot of people really, you know, jump off the boat. They will get prescribed one of these things in a five-minute encounter with their primary care doctor, and then they'll say, I didn't see anything from that drug, and oh, by the way, you know, we were pooping our brains out. Um, and, and so they quit. And... You know, that's really not the point of these drugs at all. It's it, get it, tolerate it, and stay on it. Um, because if we could create a duplicate copy of you, like Dolly the Sheep, and we gave Dolly the Sheep with Alzheimer's disease one of these drugs, and Dolly the Sheep with Alzheimer's disease and gave her nothing, then we would see that the, the individual who is getting these drugs is staying independent longer. And in some studies, um, it was looking like a year and a half or two years of extra independent living uh, as opposed to nursing homes. So they looked at this, um, I hate to use this term, but they called it delay to nursing home treatment. Um, and, and multiple studies have reproduced this data, uh, Australia, Europe, UK, et cetera. Uh, so we, we know that it really does help. You just can't feel it, and that's a bummer because I wish people did feel it. Um, but I just encourage people, get it, tolerate it, stay on it. Um, and obviously, if we're getting into a nursing home environment, then I start taking it away because that was the goal. The goal was prevent us getting there. After that point, we need to take a more geriatric approach and start getting rid of some of these things that are really not doing anything for us anymore. Um, 
But they're, they're still important tools. They're still the standard of care. Every single Alzheimer's disease clinical trial in existence allows people to be on these drugs because we do believe there is benefit. Um, when we think about drug development in Alzheimer's disease, we really need to just keep in mind that scientific discovery is not something that can be rushed. And this is to represent uh, Thomas Edison, who through his research and journals and uh, everything has, you know, people look back and they say it really took him 10,000 different tries to make a light bulb. Um, and we think about him as just this brilliant inventor who made a light bulb, but he was a really, really persistent individual. And we have to be persistent in Alzheimer's disease. And this is what we're up against. Um, you know, the industry average, uh, you know, is we, we take, you know, maybe 14 different, 15 different drugs, try them out in mice, and we end up getting one drug approved for a, any given medical condition. Um, and so there's a couple of other things up there, like some of the drug-resistant bacterias where it was a little easier to, to maybe take care of. And then maybe the hepatitis C virus is a little bit more difficult. But, but there's the Alzheimer's disease. This was as of 2015. The, the funnel is even bigger now. I mean, so we're talking about a few hundred tries to try and get one drug. So this is a complicated disease. There's lots of things going on all at the same time. And, and this is really a big challenge. And we can see that challenge in this, in this graph, I think. Um, but we, we shouldn't lose hope because of that. Part of the reason why this is a difficult disease to treat is because there's a lot of things going on. And we only have theories about what triggers what and what goes into the next thing. We, we know that there are the amyloid plaques, um, which are shown both pictorially on one side and in this slide from Nature on the other side. So we have all this, this amyloid protein that gums up the in-betweens of the brain cells. And then we have those tau proteins that go inside the, the brain cells themselves and color them black like this. So we've got, we know we've got these two proteins that develop. We're, we're not positive as to how they all work together and what triggers what, but we know that the amyloid part, those plaque parts, develop first. And uh, at Indiana University, we are also participating in what's called the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network. Uh, this is a, a network of individuals who have a genetic mutation that guarantees they will get Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we follow all those people across the United States. Uh, it's run through uh, uh, St. Louis, Washington University. And um, I, I take care of a 25-year-old who has Alzheimer's disease. His mom developed Alzheimer's disease at age 17. So these individuals, um, these individuals are really important because we know they're going to get it. We can start trying to scan them earlier. We can try and start treating them earlier. And some of this data is going to be published in uh, February of next year. They've been getting treated for over five years at this point. Um, so that's part of our understanding is, is through people who we know have a mutation that gets it. We also know that after this amyloid stuff builds up, which in those individuals we found it building up somewhere on the order of 20 years before they ever get their first symptom. So that's also something that's been a challenge for us. When, when do you start treating people? Can we detect it earlier? Do these drugs that are all failing work if we actually use them in people even earlier than what we were trying? And so that's, that's one of the, the common arguments. Um, but after the amyloid builds up, we know that the tau protein is the next thing that builds up, and tau seems to be more associated with the actual cognitive decline. So that's why there are tau drugs out there. When we first started off, we said, let's go after this amyloid stuff, and that's still a really big thing. You know, we're, we're trying to target that. The first set of drugs were actually an immunization. So instead of getting a flu shot, you'd get an amyloid shot. And then we were trying to spark the body into making antibodies that go and attack those amyloid plaques on its own. The problem was when we gave these shots to people, they ended up getting this terrible meningoencephalitis, and it was a disaster, and the, the drugs were immediately stopped. Um, so then we went into what we call active immunity, where we have to keep giving people antibodies to fight against those plaques, but we have to keep repeating it every month or every few weeks to, to make that happen. And that's what most of the drugs that are out there are like right now. And I've listed a bunch of them. Um, so we've got uh, this original one was called BAPI, and it was taken off the market because people were getting brain bleeding. Those 
amyloid proteins, not only do they develop in the brain itself, but they can also get into blood vessels. And that's where all the side effects of these drugs come from. If we're pulling these plaques out of blood vessels, we're kind of popping little, little leaks in them sometimes. And, and that definitely can happen. It, and we, we have to kind of balance how rapidly do we pull that stuff out versus how much bleeding is there going to be. So we see other drugs. Uh, solanuzumab from Eli Lilly is still in a couple of trials, including that dominantly inherited one I talked about. Uh, gantanerumab was Roche's drug, Cronuzumab, Genentech, Aducanumab terminated. I don't know. Ma maybe not. Maybe not. That's what we're going to talk about next. Um, Ban 2401. Uh, also an important drug which was recently renamed. I don't have the new name up here, but that's uh, a Biogen and ASI drug. Um, and then another Eli Lilly drug that's in a couple of trials. So these drugs target the amyloid in different stages. When it first gets misfolded, there are these tiny little globs and a couple of drugs go after that. Then they start to form um, these soluble tangles. Some drugs go after that, including aducanumab. And then some of them actually go after the plaques that have already deposited and they're no longer soluble. Um, so, so there's all kinds of different ways that we're trying to attack the amyloid. And we're not sure which way works the best, but that's why this hasn't been abandoned yet. Because people keep saying, well, the soluble stuff, that's the wrong way to go. We've got to go after the plaques. And other people say, no, no, you've got to go after the protofibrils, the ones that are kind of medium length. That's the ones to go after. So that's why people keep saying, no, I'm going to continue on my journey even though your drug failed. And as of Tuesday, you guys have, may have seen some of these news articles. Biogen stock went up a bunch. I'm not allowed to own any, um, but I was able to watch it in, in awe. Um, <laughs> and, and you see all these headlines about um, Biogen, and they, they pulled the plug on their studies. I have uh, a lot of people who are in those studies that were very disappointed because they felt like the drug was doing something important. And they said, no, no, we, we analyzed a small group and we said, no, no, this, this isn't working. We're going we're gonna to cut our losses. Then they finally got all the data together and said, wow, uh, we, we missed something here. They talked to the FDA and the FDA said, you should probably submit this to see if we can get it approved. You might need to get a little bit more data. So we're not, it's, it's not a slam dunk by any means yet. Um, some stuff you might not know. Uh, so this eMERGE study was the biggest of their clinical trials. And they, they said as of Tuesday that after we pooled all the data, it actually met its primary endpoint. This trial was a success. Um, and it was in this group of people who were getting the highest dose of the medication. Um, so th that's part of the reason why they pulled the plug earlier, because they were looking at people who got lower doses and medium doses. But the high dose group absolutely met the endpoints that they were looking for, which was a 23% re reduction in the rate of progression. So no, we're not making people better, we're slowing it down more than what Aricept and Nemenda can. So all these people in these trials were on Aricept and Nemenda. So when they say placebo, it, it's a placebo infusion, but they're still on the standard of care. Um, and then all these other measurements, including one at the end, you might not recognize all these, but the one at the end is activities of daily living. So that, that one um, had a reduction in the rate of decline by 40%. So the people who were on the placebo, they're, they're not being able to brush their teeth and put their clothes on and eat and do all those things, you know, 40% less than the people who are getting the drug. So that's a really important one, right? That's a I don't want to be in a nursing home kind of measurement. So it's a, a really important one that they looked at too. Um, they also found that the amyloid was significantly reduced in the people who got the drug. And the tau protein too, this was the important part, the tau protein as well in the spinal fluid also was reduced. So that's going back to those theories. We're always trying to prove that this theory about how amyloid and tau interact work. And they said, yeah, we're seeing that it's actually preventing progression of the disease. The other study that they were looking at and stopped early they, they said, in the people who were in it long enough and who were getting the high dose, their data looks just like the, the data from the other study. So although that study was stopped early, they said, we're, we're seeing the same stuff. This is what one of the Alzheimer's scans um, from people who received that drug. So this is a, a scan of a person who, you know, all these are people who started off in the trial. The, the red stuff is really bad. That's all the amyloid plaque that's a burden. And in the people who got placebo, you can see it's the same. And then every single 
dose of the drug, including the highest dose, gets rid of those plaques. And what's amazing is that if you've been in this study, um, you know, and this was the problem we were dealing with with our patients, if they were in the study and they got the drug, they might not qualify for any other clinical trial out there because their, their Alzheimer's scan is negative. It has re removed all of the plaque in most of these cases. So, so that was a challenge for us. We didn't know what to do with that, but it, we know it does that, and we know that other drugs do this too. We just have never found that linkage to being able to slow down the disease by removing the plaques, but we know it's doing something. The side effects, like I talked about, um, generally speaking with these drugs, somewhere around 20% to 25% maximum of people will have a side effect. And that side effect is a swelling of the brain. So again, those blood vessels become more permeable, fluid can extravasate out, we get some local swelling. That swelling can lead to headaches, mostly. Uh, some people can have another side effect, they might feel numbness or tingling or something else that's strange. But um, in basically uh, within three or four weeks, or three or four months rather, all of that stuff is gone from the MRI scan. We don't have to do anything. Um, so it seems to self-resolve, and almost nobody had any long-term consequences from it. So lots of people have a side effect. Up to a quarter of people have a side effect, but it doesn't seem to be something that's limiting to them at all. And this is an area that's going to be watched very carefully in the future because it does happen. Some people do get bleeding too. Um, that's called ARIA-H. Much, much lower percentage of people, but it does happen. Uh, we're not sure why certain people get that too, but it it's probably just depends on how much of the plaque was in their blood vessels and how fast it came out. Uh, but we're going to have to figure this part out too. Um, so basically what the, the company said is they said, if you have received this drug in the past, we are going to give it to you again starting in about March of 2020. We're submitting it to the FDA as well. Nobody else is going to be able to get that drug unless you got it before at this point, um, as far as we know right now, as of today. Um, they, they might open up another trial. We're not sure. Other drugs, as you've seen, are very similar to this one and are ongoing. Uh, Eli Lilly's drug, very similar. A drug from ASI, very similar. So there are other opportunities potentially for people. But if this gets approved, there's lots of us who think, well, what's going to happen now? Is this going to break Medicare? Great. I mean, who isn't going to want this drug? And, and how are we going to pay for it? And how, this, is, this is an infusion that somebody needs to get every four weeks. So you're going to infusion centers getting this ridiculously expensive medication. So how's that all going to work? How's it going to be paid for? How are we going to say who gets it and who doesn't get it? Does that mean that we all need to start approving these amyloid PET scans, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars too? So there's a lot of questions about you know, the financial workings of how this might work and how it's going to impact everything. Um, does this complicate the future of clinical trials too? Is this going to prevent us or slow us down from finding a real cure, something that really halts the disease? Well, it might because you know, not only are these people having negative PET scans, we don't know if they have Alzheimer's disease through one of our pieces of technology, um, everybody that's you know, going to be in a placebo group will be getting this drug too because we can't do clinical trials and withhold something that really makes a difference. So there's, there's lots and lots of questions around this and, and nobody has the answers yet but I started with uh, first awesome and lastly awesome, right? Because we want something that's going to make an impact. So although I say these things, it's really important. There are other drugs. I'll try and breeze through these parts but um, you know, some people have looked at Maybe should we try and uh, prevent the amyloid from being misfolded in the first place? Like prevent the scissors that cut the things up. Um, and those are through beta secretase and gamma secretase uh, inhibitors. Uh, these, these have failed. The gamma secretase inhibitors led to uh, increased skin cancer and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the base inhibitors actually made people worse. So every single person's, every single company's base inhibitor uh, they looked at the data and they said people were actually getting worse faster when we gave them this drug. So that was the main reason it was stopped. Um, there are some people who argue maybe they just needed a little less of that stuff to make a difference, but nobody's willing to try it right now. And then we have those tau drugs, that tau protein, maybe we should go after that independently. It seems to be more correlated with the person's actual symptoms. Um, so there's drugs that do that, and they're, they're mostly in um, phase two clinical trials, so smaller groups of people, hundreds of patients as opposed to thousands of patients. Uh, 
Um, one, one of the studies was stopped early because it didn't seem to be doing much of anything, but nobody was having side effects, thankfully. And there's a bunch of other techniques we're looking at, including this bottom technique, which I'll, you will hear more and more about this uh, um, way of treating people in the future called ASOs. This is how we're probably going to cure Huntington's disease in the next few years. This is how spinal muscular atrophy is likely cured. Um, so a really important way of treating people. And we're going to try using that technique in Alzheimer's disease as well. And then lots and lots and lots of other techniques, lots and lots of other drugs that you've probably never heard of. Everything from using ALS drugs and coconut oil and uh, trying to change the way that the bacteria in the gut work because maybe that's the trigger. There's a, a group looking at uh, deep brain stimulation. We, we actually passed on that study. I said we didn't want to be involved with it. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I mean, everything, every, people are trying all kinds of stuff. And when we look at the trials that are out there, this was as of 2017, this is what the, the landscape looks like. N you know, nobody's like putting their head in the sand and saying, oh man, we just can't do it. We, we've got all of these trials that are out there in various stages. The, the red colored ones are ones that are amyloid related, the blue ones tau related. You can see all the gray up there. Those are different ideas, different approaches, different techniques. So it's, it's wide open and people are really, really trying to make a difference. Uh, and you can see that in, in this just brief glance at everything that's out there in clinical trials right now. Briefly, uh, beyond Alzheimer's disease, of course, um, you, you all are dealing with lots and lots of different kinds of cognitive impairment, um, Parkinson's related conditions, uh, stroke related conditions, uh, other types of dementia like FTD. And, you know, uh, when I talk to patients um, and medical students and residents, um, you know, there's always this misconception. They're like, well, well, my family member was diagnosed with dementia, not Alzheimer's disease. Well, uh, you know, those are all types of dementia. Dementia just means we can measure a change in a person's thinking, and now they can't be independent because of that thinking change. But that's all it means. If someone just says, you've got dementia, they're, they're doing you a disservice because they should tell you what's causing the dementia. And as you know, in the United States, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Not true for other countries. Um, particularly Asian countries where vascular dementia is number one, uh, but in our country Alzheimer's disease is number one, closely followed by vascular dementia. Um, and we have to think about the pathology that's there because this is how we're really treating it. As you know with uh, the, the Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at the amyloid and tau, um, but in the Parkinson's studies, we have a different protein. In, in lots of other types of dementia, there's a different protein. In FTE, there's like four or five different reasons why a person can get that. So those are the targets. Those are the drug targets we're going after. Um, as I said, vascular dementia in our country is number two. It can be caused by multiple strokes or by people who just have uncontrolled risk factors and they developed all kinds of small blood vessel disease in their brain. It's very similar to what people with multiple sclerosis get after years and years and years of having the disease. Um, and usually they have you know, problems with walking and bladder dysfunction. Um, you know, they can have paralysis on one side. They're, they're really slow in coming up with the word they want to find or things like that. So it's, it's different than Alzheimer's disease, but worse because they also have gait impairment. And they tend to have a stepwise decline. Every hit makes them get worse. Um, you know, and really we just treat risk factors, and there are several support groups for, for stroke patients around town, too. The Lewy body dementias are those related to Parkinson's disease. Um, it encompasses people who have had Parkinson's disease for 15, 20, 30 years who eventually get dementia, and people who have the disease that Robin Williams, the famous actor, had called dementia with Lewy bodies, which is different. It's where you get Parkinson's and dementia at the same time. Um, and there's lots of trade-offs in trying to manage these patients. It's often quicker and worse than Alzheimer's disease because you're not dealing with a necessarily healthy person who has cognitive issues. You're dealing with someone who has mobility problems and problems with their gut and all kinds of you know, hallucinations and agitation. So it's, it's a difficult condition to treat. Um, but there are, are active clinical trials, uh, including a trial from Eli Lilly. They have one of the two active trials in the country for treating this disease. Um, so we're hoping that those drugs pan out. There's been a few failures. The company that makes Aricept is also doing a, a trial, ASI. They're, they're trying a different drug. It's 
It's been tried in Alzheimer's disease to try and treat this condition too. Pictured up at the top is a lily body, that pink uh, amorphous looking thing up there. Uh, it's huge, right? It's sitting inside of a cell. There's a bunch of orange stuff around it. That's just uh, pigmented stuff from this part of the brain. Um, but if you imagine if you had something that large inside of your body, that's probably going to slow you down. Um, so that's the alpha-synuclein buildup in Parkinson's disease and Lewy body and MSA. We also have a wonderful local uh, DLB support group. Um, and this was started by one of my patients, Mary. She's an amazing person. It's now one of the larger support groups in the country, believe it or not. It's in Zionsville. Um, frontotemporal dementia. This is really, really tough disease. Um, you know, most, most memory care units don't want anything to do with these patients. Um, this is a, a large issue for me, too, from a legal standpoint, trying to take someone who looks relatively healthy and young and telling judges that they, they need to have guardianship and... Um, I, I have to meet with more lawyers than I like because of FTD. Um, it's a really challenging condition, but uh, you know it's often misdiagnosed. There's two ways it presents. It can present with language problems, so not everybody knows that. Um, there, in fact, two of the three ways it presents are with people having trouble talking before they start to get the behavioral changes. And then the behavioral changes isn't always just a wacky, goofy person. So a lot of times it's a person who is just very apathetic. They were a fantastic employee, a, a sparkling engineer, and then they just decided they didn't want to work anymore and they're just going to sit at home all day. Um, and they get treated by psychiatrists, they get electroconvulsive shock therapy, and it doesn't change anything. And they say, I'm not depressed, I'm just going to chill right here. Uh, and they have FTD too sometimes, so it's a different way that the disease can present. And we do have exciting clinical trials, and we, we may actually be able to stop FTD before we can stop Alzheimer's disease, I hate to say that, but um, FTD is very genetic, uh, and we can identify mutations in a lot of people, a majority of people who have this disease. And in that sense, we're able to target those genes and go after it, and we've got phase two clinical trials now uh, for almost all the forms of FTD, so that's going to be very exciting in the future. So that's it. I hope I didn't bore you too much. This was our October break um, in Napa Valley and Yosemite. Um, I'm happy to field any questions that you guys have about anything. Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, so the folks that were on the Biogen uh, drive, they've obviously had a six month break, and now they're going to potentially go through till March of next year before they come back on. In your opinion, do you think, I mean, I know the folks that are that experienced that and, and they've declined in their functioning in that short period of time. So I'm wondering, Yeah, there's a lot of questions around that right now. Um, there's a lot of questions about how are we going to get to the high dose. We're going to have to start low and go up, so every, we're not going to be able to go there right away. Um, there's also talk about is someone going to be too impaired to go back into the clinical trial. So there's, we haven't seen the details. We're supposed to have the details fleshed out by January. When they get, then they're going to come out to all of our sites, and they're going to say here's the new criteria to get back in. But the only people who are eligible are people who have received it in the past. But you're right, uh, it's unfortunate, and a lot of our patients have said, I feel awesome on this drug, why are they stopping it? And it's a real tragedy. Uh, unfortunately, it's a financial pencil pusher kind of a, an error that was made, I think. Yes? Yeah, so it's a neurodegenerative disease. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about does trauma potentially trigger or, you know, bring on a neurodegenerative process quicker. So that, that may be possible. We just don't, we've nev never been able to prove that. So anecdotally, I feel like, yeah, you know, just as the same example, if someone goes into the hospital and has a big surgery, and then after the surgery they're like, mom or dad wasn't the same. They weren't having memory problems before. Th this must have caused a problem. Well, it, it probably just hastened the onset or, you know, kind of pushed things along in a process that was already trickling underneath the surface. And that's basically the thought process behind trauma and FTD, though. We do think of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what the NFL players get. That's also a, an accumulation of tau, which is similar to some forms of FTD. So there's a lot of linkage there we don't quite understand. We do have now 
tau imaging, so we can scan a person's brain just like an amyloid PET scan, and we can see the tau deposition. And that's going to help us unlock the differences between trauma and NFL player football hits and people who just sporadically get it. Yes? I'm in Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I supplied a PDF to the group here. Um, it, it's happy to be shared. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, in simple words, please, doctor, today we're not treating dementia, Alzheimer's, we're stabilizing the patient as an part A and part B. Can you explain to me how can a placebo control double blind study? And the placebo patient is getting drugged. How do you differentiate placebo from the drug? How do you differentiate the placebo from the drug? The effect. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Did I understand you correctly that if it's double blind Correct. Study, Correct. Somebody will be on placebo. Correct. So if I'm a placebo patient, am yes. I getting drug or only placebo? Only placebo until you enter the open label extension phase, which is what these individuals did. So in other words, they were randomized, controlled for a period of time. It can be six months or a year. And then the carrot at the end of that is, no matter what you were on, we're going to give you the drug in the end. So 100% of people were getting drug at the end. Yeah. And we can't tell the difference. It's double dummy. So we've got bags hanging that look the same, and people are getting infusions of saline. And we can't tell. We don't know. Only our pharmacist knows. Correct. Yeah, and, and I think the definition of a cure uh, varies a lot between person to person. Um, when I think of a cure, I think of prevention, preventing a person from getting Alzheimer's disease. If you have the disease, my definition of cure is we stop the disease where it's at and it doesn't progress any further. I think we're, uh, you know, uh, the goal of reversing any sort of cognitive changes is really a blue sky dream right now. We don't have that kind of technology. We don't have, so, you know, people have been dabbling with stem cells for years. It just hasn't panned out. So I don't think that's an immediate goal. Yes? Will diet and lifestyle changes help after the onset of disease? I care for my elderly parents. One is severely demented. One is rapidly and your diet is terrible, it never has been. I just wonder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, I think the earlier you make changes, the more impact lifestyle has. If, if we're dealing with someone who has severe or somebody who is really requiring support for everything and we start instituting you know, lifestyle changes, it's not going to have as big of an impact as in someone who is in the early stages or pre-diagnosis. But I, I think it can make some difference. It's just... It can be worth a try, yep. I mean, I think in the end, when we're dealing with moderate and severe stage patients, my goal is quality of life. And if, if I'm having to, you know, like use a bullwhip to get somebody off a couch to go do, you know, to walk on a treadmill, that's probably not worth it, right? Exercise is not going to happen. <laughs> right, right. So I think we can, we can encourage as many of those things as possible, but the key is to start them early. Thank you. Yeah. In the back, yes. Correct. That is absolutely yeah, correct. Aducanumab. Yes, we, we think that is true. That is correct. The, the cholinesterase inhibitors don't affect the pathology. They, they help maintain a, an important neurotransmitter that's in the brain that's used to communicate between cells. So we keep that neurotransmitter around longer, and that seems to preserve independence, but it's not having an ultimate impact on the pathology. That's right. correct. I just want to make sure that was yes, your understanding is correct. Yeah. How does that compare to the cost of having to put people into facilities and the cost of people that maybe you don't even capture because they're carrying them themselves? Sure. Yeah. A great question. Um, you know, I, it, it depends on how you look at it and who's paying for it, and you know, how, how much is Medicare paying for someone to be in a facility versus Medicaid, and you know, how how much is 
you know, Medicare able to, to manage the burden of this condition? I mean, yeah, there's expensive drugs out there too, like uh, MS drugs and things like that. But can you imagine if everybody wanted this, you know, who knows how much it's going to cost, but maybe maybe fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year. If every Medicare recipient wanted to have that drug, there wouldn't be Medicare anymore. So that that's one of the bigger global financial issues with an approved drug that's like this. You know, is is the government going to step in and say, "Thanks so much for developing that drug. We want it for ten dollars for every patient." Uh, you know, so is that going to happen to Biogen? I don't know. I don't know. Thankfully, we're going to have some competing drugs, but. I don't know how that's going to all work out. It's complicated, but I agree with you. Um, you know, the the cost of nursing home care versus the cost of preventing that is a big picture sort of thing. But we don't put a lot of thought into prevention as much as we should in the United States and thinking about those big picture items. All right. Thank you very much. Um, in an interest of moving on, um, I, I can step out and answer any questions on the side. Thank you, Dr. Brush. Uh, that's awesome, and and thank you for what you do too to help advance this. And um, it's very, you know, it's an exciting time um, in a lot of different ways with our knowledge and understanding this condition, um, not just from a pharmaceutical standpoint, but I think from my perspective, um, as over the years we've been learning more and more about the association of lifestyle and that um, all the other factors. You know, it's such a complex, multifactorial condition, right? So there's not one linear thing that that solves the problem or prevents the problem. But I think um, what's really optimistic about all this is that we're learning more and more that despite genetics, despite a lot of different things, we actually have a lot of control ourselves over um, these things. So while we might not have a cure per se, um, it sounds like we're getting closer and closer to a disease modifying agent. But in the meantime, we do have our own control that we can use to uh, reduce chances or at least delays um, the onset of these things through, through lifestyle factors. So, so that's encouraging to me. Um, Dr. Rafiq, it's almost like you set us up for a quick uh, transition. So um, I promise I didn't pay you. But I'd like to, uh, before we uh, sit down with Tom, introduce you to uh, Melinda Wendy, who is Sakoa's Community Programs Coordinator to just give you a quick overview. If you haven't heard about a program called Dementia Friends Indiana, she's gonna give you a brief overview about what this is, and we really encourage you to get involved because when we talk about the future and what this disease looks like in the future, we're also suffering from it right now in our own communities. And so what do we do about it today until those other groundbreaking things come through? And so with this Dementia Friends Indiana movement, I can unbiasedly say it's, it's probably the most impactful game-changing, needle-moving um, movement that I've ever been a part of in such a short amount of time. So, um, Mindy, if you want to come up and uh, give them the news. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Might not even need this microphone, to be honest. So thank you for the introduction. Again, I am Melinda Winnie, the Community Programs Coordinator here at Sokoa, and I have the absolute privilege of working alongside Dustin Ziegler on the Dementia Friends Indiana Movement. Oh. <laughs> oh. So I'll try to whew, wipe the tears away. Um, but anyway, so I just want to give you a little snapshot, snapshot of what this movement is and really why this means so much to me, clearly. Um, so what this is, Dementia Friends is a global grassroots social movement um, that aims to change the way we perceive dementia. So the way we think about dementia, the way we speak about dementia, and ultimately the way we care and treat for people who are living with this condition. And so what's so neat about this, there are about 51 countries who have an established Dementia Friends movement um, in their country right now. And so the United States is one of those countries. Um, and so what I truly appreciate the most about this movement is the fact that it is an all community sectors approach. So it is not just people in the healthcare industry, people working in aging services, um, you know, neurologists, geriatricians who need to understand this information. It is each and every single one of us, each and every single one of us in this room. 
um, each and every single one of us in the communities. So when I say an all community sectors approach, I mean that. I mean your faith communities. I mean your grocery stores, your libraries, your first responders, uh, our public spaces, transportation services. I mean, again, anything you can think of that you know, encompasses a community, that is who we are trying to reach with this information. Um, and just again, increase the understanding um, and awareness. And awareness of yes, what dementia is, what are the signs, what are the symptoms, but ultimately the community resources. Make people aware of SOCOA and all that we have to offer. Make people aware of the Alzheimer's Association. Make people aware of geriatricians. I mean, the list goes on. So again, that connecting piece, and that's really what I've come to appreciate again about this movement is it really serves to connect people connect people to education, connect people to resources, but connect people through stories, too. Um, I have a whole thing written up here, but I'll probably just go off because I've got five minutes to do a presentation that I typically do in an hour. So we got to condense this. Um, so again, you know, why, why the need for this community approach? Well, nearly 70% of people who are living with some form of dementia are living in our communities. They're not in nursing facilities, they're not in memory care units. Yes, a, a handful of them are, but the majority of them are our neighbors. They're living amongst us. And so again, for us to better understand what they are going through, appreciate the challenges, but also know how to help them. So Dementia Friends Indiana, so we brought the movement here. I can't say we, I have to give the credit to Dustin. <laughs> Dustin brought the movement here in August of 2017, and in just over two years, we have reached 3,917 people with our education um, workshop that we offer. And so that is both in person, um, we offer a one hour, it's free, a one hour workshop where again, we are covering really the fundamentals. So what, what dementia is, the four most common types that you had touched on earlier in your presentation, um, the signs, the symptoms, giving you communication tools so you can better interact with these individuals and feel more comfortable, quite frankly, and more confident in those interactions as well. Um, so we touch on a number of, of different things in that one hour. And then we also have the online option as well. So if you're not able to attend an in-person session, you have that option to receive the same information, the same workbook, um, if you were to just go online as well. So that's just a little bit um, about the impact we've had on the education side of things. And then we've be, we have had the opportunity to develop some really unique partnerships over the last two years as well. And so many of you have probably heard of Connor Prairie um, and may be familiar with the memory cafe that they offer there. And just real quick, memory cafes are really just an opportunity um, for both the caregiver and the person living with any form of dementia at truly any stage for them to be in the community together, enjoying one another, learning from other caregivers, um, and again, just ultimately being out um, in public and not feeling that shame and that stigma that so often keeps these people isolated in their homes. So Connor Prairie has created memory cafes, Hamilton East Public Library, the Fishers location has a memory cafe at this time, and I just got word earlier this week their Noblesville location will begin um, offering memory cafes in March of 2020, so that's exciting. Um, other unique, unique partnerships, my gosh, um, Partnership with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Dustin worked for, gosh, about a year um, to develop a curriculum for all first responders to receive this information that we are teaching in our workshops, but again, to tailor it to the work that they are doing. So that's expected to reach um, 100,000 or so first responders in this state alone. Um, gosh, I could just go on for days. Last month, we started our first dementia choir so we had a very passionate human being by the name of Rick Cobb who came to us with this grand idea to start a chorus for people living with dementia and their caregivers. Um, and so they are in what, week four, I believe, of their eight week workshop. And so November 6th, um, they will be having a performance. Um, so if anybody's interested in that information, I'd be happy to give it to you. I could just go on for days about all that we've really been able to accomplish, but this is truly just the beginning. Um, and so to kind of wrap this up, hopefully this has made sense, um, but to wrap this up, you know, why as a 28 year old do I wake up every day and want to talk about something that is so daunting and heartbreaking? Um, because I've lived this. <laughs> I've lived this. I, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease when I was in high school, and she passed away three months after I graduated from college. 
Um, and so again, you know, for somebody who's been through this, and I, I'm so fortunate that I was old enough to know and to be a part of her care, to provide that physical care to her. Um, but there was also so much, and, and what I'm out there preaching today is what I wish my family would have known back then. The signs, the symptoms, what to do, who to turn to for help. We didn't know any of that. We learned near the end. But again, to take a proactive approach to educating people, making people more aware, and again, connecting people, and allowing caregivers and people who are living with this condition to share their story and to not fear the stigma that is so tightly suffocating this condition. Um, so, you know, that, that's really what this means to me in a nutshell, and it just means the world that you all are here today to just hear the, the just exciting research, the advancements that have come along. All of that is so exciting, but I don't think that we are excused from understanding what these individuals are going through. And so thank you so much for just allowing me a few minutes to share something that is so near and dear to my heart. Um, and I hope you guys look forward to, uh, to this speech, or excuse me, to the interview with, with Tom. So thank you guys so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Mindy. Um, wow. So get involved if you have it. Um, DementiaFriendsIndiana.org is your first step. Um, and then go from there. Like, like we could talk all day about the developments that have occurred in just, in just two short years. Uh, when we started this, if you could have told me where we're at now, I would say it would take 10 years to get to this point. It's been two. And there's some exciting announcements to come from a state level soon, too. So stay tuned for that. So. Um, and there's brochures over here if you, if you want to learn more. So uh, with that, that's a good transition to talk about and introduce my friend Tom Coverdale. If you uh, remember Tom, 1998, Mr. Basketball in the Brazil High School. I went to Hamilton Heights, so there was a bit of an issue there. <laughs> but I um, went on to Indiana University to play for Bob Knight, Mike Davis. Uh, led them to the 2002 National Championship. And um, Tom has a unique story um, that he's going to come share with us today, so we're going to talk to a, little, a little bit about him. So come on up, buddy. Please welcome Tom Coverdale. I'm glad you got me, Graham. Can you hear me? All right, there we go. Well, I got to tell you, you kind of, you have a pretty unique story. I mean, uh, not only what we went through with your mother, but at the time you were going through it. So I think, you know, let's let's just start there with, you know, how you provide us a little background of your mother being diagnosed. And uh, Yeah, well, this started out, you know, my, my family dynamic growing up. I have two older brothers that are five and seven years older than me. I was fortunate enough to to have a great family growing up, a really close family. Um, so my mom was the type of person, I mean, you can imagine with three boys, uh, she did everything. She was the rock of our family. She cooked every meal. She never missed a game of any of her kids' sporting events. So, you know, anytime you have someone that cares for you and does that much and, and everybody, you know, I hope this was fortunate enough to have a parent or two parents like that, which I was, um, you know, it kind of shocks you. So you, you, you move into that. Um, you know, she was the kind of person that um, the warm, the warmest, kindest person in the world. All of my friends and my brother's friends, she wanted them all at her house and cooked for all of them. It was an open door. Everybody looked at her as kind of their second mom, uh, just to give you a, a vision of, of my mom. So. <clears throat> you know, then moving into college, there was two things that happened when we knew uh, something was not right. And um, the first thing, she actually worked at Roche, uh, one of one of the uh, companies that the doctor was talking about. Um, and she had worked there for over 25 years. Uh, we lived in Noblesville, so it's not that long of a drive. And the first time uh, she, she called my dad, and she, she had to stop and call my dad. And <coughs> pre-cell phone and she was lost and she didn't know how to drive home so that was the first thing um, and then the second thing it was uh, right before my senior year of basketball started um, so we uh, it was our first preseason game my senior year uh, she had obviously been to assembly hall many times with it being my senior year so 
you know, the parents section, if you've been to assembly hall, is kind of across from the benches, kind of in the middle of the floor, kind of down low. And uh, she told my dad she had to go to the bathroom. So she went up uh, about eight minutes ago in the first half. Uh, it gets close to halftime. She's not there. She's not there. The driving thing had just happened. So my dad went and looked for her. And if you've been to assembly hall, to end up on the other side of assembly hall is kind of hard to do. And that's where she had ended up having no idea where she was. Um, so that kind of is when we first started uh, learning. And, and the good thing, and I think the most important thing for a family to realize is, is you have four alpha males who think they know everything about the world, especially a 22 year old, right? Um, the thing I give my dad credit for is he got us together. We knew nothing about the disease. Uh, she was 55 years old when she got it, so she had early onset. Um, so it took us totally off guard. I think when we think about dementia and these diseases, we think about, you know, an elderly person getting at the end of their life, and normally they pass away from something other than dementia because it's so further along in their life. Well, we got to see the full effect. She got it at 55, passed away at 63 uh, in 2010. So. Uh, but the thing, getting back to the thing I give my dad credit for is right after that happened, he called me and my brother and he says, hey, I know something's not right with mom, we've got to get together. He got the diagnosis, we sat down um, with the Alzheimer's Association, with a professional and learned exactly what is going to happen, what do we need to do. The life expectancy is two to ten years. You know, if you get upset with her for asking the same question twice, you're doing nothing but upsetting her. Um, you know, just stuff that you need to learn. Hey, when she go to a restaurant, she gets further along. Don't look at her and say, what do you want? Say, hey, do you want a Coke or a water? Give her two options so she can choose and try to make things easier for them. And that's kind of uh, the family dynamic and how we found out about my mom having the disease. Thank you. And I have questions, but we can move by go totally off as we really do this time. When you, when you got that diagnosis, did you feel kind of a sense of relief to the extent that at least we know what's, what's going on? Uh, not, I mean, a little bit, I mean, but not really, to be honest with you, because at 22 years old, you don't know nothing about anything, let's be honest. <laughs> and especially about a disease this complex. So I'm living the best years of my life in college and, you know, Alzheimer's was the least of my worries. I knew something was wrong with her and I was hoping we could figure it out and see what was going on. But, you know, at that point when you hear that, you know, two to 10 years, it's kind of a earth shattering thing for, for me and my family. Um, but the biggest thing that I learned when we sat down with those professionals is, you know, enjoy the memories you have. Don't look at this as, I mean, yes, it's one of the worst things that's gonna happen to you. But she's still here. She's still alive. Make as memory, make as many memories as you can with her. Laugh as much as you can with her. Tell her you love her as much as you can. And, and that's what we tried to do from that point on. On the diagnosis, um, you're informing your family, your friends. How, I mean, what was that conversation like? How, how did they react to that? Did they understand the condition? Especially 55. You think, like you mentioned, you already mentioned it. Older adult, not a 55 year old. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, they kind of prepared us for this. When you tell family and friends, people are going to have different reactions. You can't take it personal, um, even though it's kind of hard to. I think, especially back in, in those days, I think the information and knowledge of people are coming further and further each year we pass along. But back at that time, it was either, you know, you're, people are going to be all on board to help you out or it's going to scare them and they're gonna kinda of don't wanna see your mom like this, and they're not gonna come around as much. You know, friends, you know, not necessarily me, but for my dad. And, and we experience that too, um, you know. So, but as far as, you know, it, it, it's just like it is today. You kinda, of, if you have a family member that's gone through it, you kinda of understand it. If not, I think that's where the, the, the groups like Sakoa and other places that are trying to get the knowledge out there the more people are aware and, and understand what's going on, the better. 
Um, but yeah, it was the same back then where you kind of have to educate people on what you're going to see, what's going to happen, and where it's going to go from there. Yeah, we, I mean, with Mitch friends in Indiana, one of the reasons we started this movement is there's still a significant knowledge gap. Like I talk about dementia being so prevalent, an epidemic, affects so many people, yet more than any other condition I know, still one that's probably um, the one people understand the least uh, and have misconceptions about. As as our as our disease advance, um, obviously your function decline, um, going out to places, restaurants, and things. Can you can you speak on what that was like? What that transition was like? Were there any challenges? Uh, I think there's a lot of people families don't think about when you're, you know, we do, and one of the things we were told is, you know, don't be afraid to go out and be social. You know, it, it, she's got to live her life too. So we went to restaurants, but what we found ourselves doing was, it, it was so much better if we knew to went to a restaurant. We knew the waitress, and we had been there several other times because they knew what my mom was going through. And there's little things you don't think about. Just think about my dad and mom going to dinner, just the two of them. And my dad has to go to the restaurant. <coughs> what do What do you do? Um, little things like that. So every restaurant place that are knowledgeable that can get training for people and know they have dementia before they sit down, they're going to be able to wait on them better, service them better. Um, so what my dad started doing is they went to a lot of the same places that they knew were friendly and knowledgeable and knew about my mom's situation, because so he could look at it and say, "Hey, I have to go to the restroom." Can keep an eye on her for a couple minutes because there could have been several times when he's in the restroom and you know that dementia person has that safe place with their caregiver that everybody here who's gone through it experiences that and it, it could take five to ten seconds for him to be in the bathroom and her to realize he's not there but to have someone knowledgeable there to help it's stuff that people don't think about, about how much the knowledge and getting it out of the community can help families that are going through something similar with my yeah. We already answered my next question, which was going to be, I mean, what, what do you think as communities we, we should be taking action to do to, to make our environments more welcoming and conducive? But it sounds like just the very thing you mentioned, education. Um, and, and probably from your experience, small things, right? So just understanding the condition, having those plans in place that if I have a loved one with this condition, whether I'm going to a bank, my church, whatever, if I need to go to the restroom, I know that there's a plan in place for that because whatever this environment is, yeah. whatever this organization is, let's put that plan in place. I think it's just education and, it, and it's a tough disease because if you run into someone you don't know, it, with it being a mental disease, it's hard to tell someone has it unless you're informed. So, I mean, there's many obstacles you know you have to go through with this disease, even educating people, because it's hard to know who has it unless you know the family member. But I think it starts with educating the families, which is it's come so far of the people that are going through it, and then educate communities and places where people are going to be nonstop and have kind of training in different places like restaurants and people that service people, I think is a good start. But you're not gonna reach everybody who doesn't wanna be reached, but if you start with the people that are come in most contact with the individuals that have the disease, I think that's the place you start with. So from your experience, when you lived through the, the whole thing, as did your family um, and, and your friends, you know, looking back, what you were going through, the challenges you faced, the things maybe wish you would have done or known. What may be some of the core things that you would advise or encourage the caregiver, say a spouse or a son or daughter of someone? What would you encourage, either advice or what they should know most? I would say there's really two most important things that I feel like my family did well. We could have done more. You always look back and think you could have done more. Um, well, really three things. First thing is is make as many memories with your mom or your caregiver as possible. Don't just sit there and dwell on the sadness. Because I have so many good times with my mom even after she got diagnosed that we can get into it here in a little bit. And then there's some funny stories that you can still, that me and my family think about today. Uh, two is we uh, were lucky enough to have the Alzheimer's Association when we went through this. So we got into groups I went to it with my dad one time where my dad, mom, and 
my mom went into a room with everybody who had the disease and they got to kind of got to talk about with a professional leading the group what they're going through and then but me and my dad went to another room and they got to bounce ideas off of each other it's like hey i just my spouse just did this what would you guys do and then you were oh i encountered that two weeks ago i did this and this calmed them down and this worked and it just you could see the relief off of my dad when i went with him it was kind of like he slumped in a seat and could relax and he was actually talking to people about what he was going through where you're so isolated as a caregiver where you know you feel like the world's against you and the third thing is is you have to take care of the caregiver just as much as you take care of the person with the disease. Uh, there were so many times that when they told us that as professionals that, you know, one of my brothers would go and be with mom and then we would, uh, you know, one time we, we got my uh, sister-in-law to stay with my mom and me and my two brothers and my dad surprised him and went to Chicago for a Cubs game. I mean, that's something he, he if we would have asked him, he would have said no. It's like I cannot be away from my mother for a whole day but we had arranged the whole thing we're like you're doing it and when he got there it was like we had dad pack too uh, but you know again you, you, you have to do stuff like that because just think about if you're taking care of someone and you have to do every aspect of their life cleaning even feeding them you know talking to them with no substance of com conversation at all they need a mental break from everything. So even grabbing them, going to dinner with them for two hours and so they can sit there and even if they want to be quiet or sit there and have a normal conversation, they need that mentally too. So those are the three things I think are most important when a family is going through that. Yeah, and thank you for the caregiver assist. I mean that, you know, I, in this work I've always described really any type of dementia is a two person, a minimum two person condition. You know, the one who has the pathology of the disease and then at least one other caregiver who was, who was going through their own situation as a result of the disease, just without the same pathology. And obviously the caregiver goes down, what happens to the one that they're caring for? So um, you mentioned funny stories, good stories. Uh, you know, one, one of the things about Dementia Friends, you, you, know, you mentioned that people who have been through it um, understand it. For those who don't, um, I don't understand the condition all that well. There's a lot of stigma around it. There's, there's a lot of negative images, and that's all that we sometimes perceive. With Dementia Friends in Indiana, we're really keen to disrupt that, in that, yeah, you have this condition, but you can still enjoy a good life, have good memories, engage. So with that, um, what are some of these highlights, <laughs> stories? Um, well, one is my probably my favorite you know it was a day you know I would when I got out of basketball I coached college basketball for six years and one of the summers I took a job that allowed me to come home for the summer so I could be with mom so I stayed with my my dad and mom for a whole summer uh, when my dad went to work so we didn't have to get that much care and, and all that kind of stuff so you know just like any other caregiver I felt like I had a million things to do that day you know my dad gave me the to-do list right you know, she had, we went and got a haircut in the morning, and then we had to go to the grocery, and then I had to take the dogs to the vet. So I get go and take her to get a haircut. We, we, we're getting ready to we get the groceries. I get home, I throw everything, you know, put everything away. And okay, so we start heading to the vet. And uh, if anybody has, you know, obviously had someone with dementia, they, uh, you know, the cells spark every once in a while. And, she this is one of those times and i'm driving she's like tom and i'm like yeah she goes shouldn't we have the dogs in the car <laughs> <laughs> and we both just we both were laughing so hard we were crying <laughs> and i called my dad on the phone who was at work i was like you are not gonna believe this <laughs> my mom remembered the dogs were in the car so uh just funny stuff like that and, you know just cherishing another one that uh, I thought about this morning on the way here is uh, Noblesville has these free concerts downtown around the square and my mom was the biggest Elvis fan in the world and they had an Elvis impersonator one time she was pretty far along in her disease and she really thought it was Elvis 
And so, of course, we went along with it, seeing the joy on her face. I mean, you've got to do that until it went horribly wrong. <laughs> so she wants to get close to the stage. So my dad goes up there with her. He had some scarf or something, and he threw it off the stage. And her and like a 16 or 17-year-old girl both grabbed it at the same time. And she yanked it out of her hands as she was getting Elvis' scarf. <laughs> Luckily, about five to ten, you know, minutes later, my dad got it from her and went and gave it to the girl. Um, but just stuff like that, it, it, we look back on it and it's just mom. I mean, if she was passionate about something, like her family and her boy, she was the nicest person in the world. But we look back and somebody messed with something she was passionate about and came out that way. <laughs> Uh, you know, it sounds like that's kind of uh, that was still your mom before dementia. When I hear about some of the stories of her getting kicked out of basketball games and other, other components of her passion, and yeah, definitely, um, that story is a good one. <laughs> um, so, big sports family growing up. I was like 11 years old. Uh, we went to Newcastle and played a basketball game there, like a summer A basketball game. So. Um, you know, the, there's only parents in the stands in an 11 year old game. <laughs> it's not like she was, I don't think she was even in the wrong here, but we're at Newcastle. We're up by like three points with like three minutes to go in the game. The guy running the clock is probably a parent. I mean, we're 11, who cares, right? <laughs> he, uh, he didn't start the clock in accident, probably the first time. A minute later, it's a real close game. He doesn't start the clock again. Third time, I'm like, oh, all right, we really are in Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> that started the third time. And after the third time, my mom, along with three or four other parents, literally just stand up and start yelling, start the clock. Well, the ref, my mom was in front of the whole parent section. She happened to be the closest one at the court, just looked at her and said, get out of here. If you've ever been to Newcastle's gym, that's a long walk up the stairs <laughs> by yourself with no one there. So she felt like somebody was messing with one of her sons. So we, the game ends. She says, I have to go to the restroom because she just kind of stood at the top of that big arena. And me and my dad go to the car and he's like, do not say a word when she gets in this car. <laughs> And that is the wrong thing to say to an 11 year old. <laughs> so she gets in the car and I just, the first thing out of my mouth, it's just the three of us in the car. And I said, mom, why did you do that? And she just went off for five minutes about how the ref was wrong. And my dad just looked at me with a bad look. Like, He's gonna kill me when I got home. But just stuff like that. She was the sweetest lady in the world, but she, she had a fiery personality, just like me and my brothers and sometimes, too. It's the stuff that we look back on and enjoy to talk about. Well, thank you, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to just to share before we wrap things up? Um, if anybody's going through it right now, um, it's, it is one of the hardest times of your life, but enjoy everything you can. When I was with my mom and she was at the end, my goal every day, I loved her laugh, right? There's certain things you love about your loved ones that you still have, whether it's a smile or a laugh or the way they look at you. So I tried to get it to a point where we were laughing so hard together every single day, whether I was doing the stupidest things in the world in front of her that I knew would make her laugh. And that's something that I look back on and I'm glad I did because if you have those memories. It's a tough time. And then also for the people that aren't the direct caregiver, take care of the whole family need it and, I, and the other thing is, is I'm just real excited I haven't been in a setting where I've got to learn about the research since we went to Phoenix for the Alzheimer's Association together so to hear the strides that everybody's making and stuff I think it is getting better but doing stuff like this and more people um, is that me? sorry um, the more people that have stories and you can get out there, don't be afraid to tell your story. I know while you're going through it, trust me, I didn't tell my story for a long time. It's tough when you go through it, but once you're comfortable at your decision and go out there, you can help other families and other people be aware of what people go through and then maybe less people will be 
um, afraid of the disease or afraid to be around someone with dementia, and I think that's important. Perfect. That's, the, that's what I want to set up. That's a perfect way to, to wrap things up with that message. That's why we're here and what we're trying to do, what we're doing. You know, Dr. Broach, just like I mentioned, this is an exciting time. The future looks bright one day, but until that future gets here, we got this going on right now, and yeah, that's some, some heavy words of this. So, so thank you, sir. Um, we appreciate all you do for our Sokoa. Uh, all you do, we know you're passionate, we know you're busy. Uh, so we really thank you for your, your time here. We have uh, just a couple of minutes. I know, you know, mainly this was for Tom to share his story and shine light on the other side of this condition. But if anybody has any questions, we got just a couple of minutes. If you have any. I mainly just see people crying, so. For <laughs> <laughs> questions, so. Well, thank you again, sir. We appreciate all it. Right, well, thank thanks you. for having me. Thank you all for your